Archaeology is the study of ancient cultures, the artificial creations, the sites, the artifacts, the structures that humans created. Much of archaeology is looking at the details of the land. What we're trying to do is understand the past. Through discarded materials. What can you tell about that place at that time from what animals were living there? You know, what did people eat? And the connection to the environment, some of those things are still enduring today, and that's a symbolism of their endurance. Minnesota, 16,000 years ago, was still mainly covered with ice. And there's just not a lot of animals living there. So Minnesota really takes off culturally is probably about 12,000 years ago. The ice is leaving, Lake Agassiz is forming up in the northwest corner, but it's a very different Minnesota. All of Minnesota is covered with spruce trees. In those spruce trees are some very different looking animals. There are beaver as big as me, there are mastodons, which are browsing on it. And at the peak of this 6,000 years ago, all of Minnesota, except the very northeast corner, is prairie. The buffalo, the bison, have spread throughout the whole state. Then the climate reverses about 6,000 years ago and starts getting cooler and wetter. And by 4,000 years ago, we have our modern three zones, prairie in the west and southwest, a deciduous forest band through the center, and the coniferous and mixed deciduous forest way up in the north. When the French come into Minnesota in 1650, that's what they see are these three zones. And who they see living in those zones are uh, the Dakota around Lake Mille Lacs. We have to understand that prior to pre-contact, the Dakota, the Oto, the Iowa, and the Ho-Chunk specifically for the southeast part of Minnesota, all inhabited this area. Where they're gathering wild rice and parching it, they're getting maple syrup from the trees, they're hunting deer, they're doing a lot of fishing. You had a vast trade network. And so when you look at the social structure and the connection to the environment, some of those things are still enduring today. And that's a symbolism of not only how Native Americans thrive together, but coexisting together. The way that I explain archaeology is that you are taking all available evidence, the things that people left behind, and especially when you're dealing with pre-contact archaeology, there isn't a written record. If there are no historical records, we use the term prehistoric. And so prehistoric archaeology is the archaeology of peoples who have not left any historical records. It sometimes can be hard to get it across without examples of like, you know, we don't have giant flashy pyramids, but you know, we have the mound groups all over the state. We have over 12,000 mounds in the state that have been documented. Indian mounds in Minnesota started being built about 500 BC, probably about 1650 AD. It used to be thought that people were only buried in the burial mounds, or that was sort of the overriding assumption. The more we learn, the more we realize that there are people in between the burial mounds. It's a cemetery. The complexity of what it took to build a mound, basket by basket, and share that responsibility of caring and treating for those mounds speaks to the sophistication of the natives who inhabited this area. When I see a burial mound today, there's no mistaking what my responsibility is, and that's to help protect and preserve those sites from negative impacts. Thomas Jefferson is in some ways regarded as the first American archeologist because he excavated a burial mound on his property and he did gorgeous diagrams of what it looked like, started thinking about what it was. But as they moved farther and farther west, and especially got into Ohio, they're called the Hopewellian mounds because it was found by a town near Hopewell in Ohio that were loaded with very elaborate artifacts, you know, copper sheets that had been embossed and, and gorgeously carved shells and things like that that were from the Gulf Coast. And no Indian groups were using these anymore. So 
the scientists of the day basically said, oh, these can't have been built by the Indians because they, they don't build mounds anymore. And look at all these artifacts that don't seem to relate to them at all. So a whole myth developed, and it's called the myth of the mound builders. So they started looking to Europe, of course. This was a, looked like a complex society, so they must be Europeans. So they started thinking, oh, these are the lost tribe of the Welsh, or this is the lost tribe of Israel. Well, by the 1890s, archaeology is becoming a science. And the Smithsonian Institution was looking at these and mapping all these mounds. And finally, some of the Smithsonian uh, Institution scientists finally said in the 1890s, nope, these were not built by these Europeans. These were built by ancestors of American Indians. The Minnesota State Archaeologist is in charge of overseeing a couple of Minnesota laws. One has to do with archaeology on public land. So if a city owns an archaeological site or the state owns an archaeological site, it's my job to make sure that that site is taken care of appropriately. And then the other aspect of my job is dealing with cemeteries and burials or people that are found during construction projects. And sometimes we'll get questions about, you know, the Vikings. We don't have the information, the evidence that would support Viking settlements here. It seems like people that want to believe that are determined to believe it and are generally going to be interested in that rather than actual archaeology. Some people consider the term pseudoscience insulting because they know that the term is referring to the things they believe. Others, like many archaeologists, will use the term pseudoscience to refer to work that's been done that um, contradicts scientific findings. Well, science wasn't always important in, in archaeology. When I started school at the University of Minnesota in the late 60s, there was a debate raging in archaeology. And it was, is archaeology science? And if we're going to be a science, let's fully behave like scientists. Archaeologists go to places and use all sorts of techniques and methods to learn about what happened at a place where they found physical remains in or on the ground. They may be ecofacts, natural objects like pieces of wood, artifacts or things that people made, animal bones, seeds from plants. So science works by, you have a set of hypotheses. You address these hypotheses by experimentation or with regard to archeology, span with digging. We would go to a site, first thing we had to do was put in a reference point from which we could make measurements. Then lay out a grid over the site so that everything that we found could be put into Cartesian coordinates, you know, north, south, east, west, up, down. Then they had to start digging in layers if we had natural stratigraphy. Or if there were no natural layers, I would dig by arbitrary levels. Usually you'll see little black specks, and usually that's a sign of charcoal. You know, these are burnt remains, and when they're burnt, they stay preserved. What we do is we collect the entire, all the soil, any matrix with it, and we put it into bags, and we take it back to a lab setting, and we do what we call a flotation process. The botanicals typically float to the surface, we let them dry, and then I go through the microscope and do a sorting of it. The dominant plant remains that we find are your corn, your beans, and your squash. You know, they have their domesticated plants, but they also have the plants that they have to go and forage and gather. So that's also the interesting part is like, what are they seeking out to put part of their diet? Because sometimes your hypotheses or your question might lead into being something you already thought or it might take you down a completely different path. Technically, you don't test that idea, you test the alternatives to that idea. A good scientist tries to falsify their hypothesis. And you're left with one that seems right. You're never positive it's right for true science. You're 99.9% .9 sure it's right. And I got caught on this with the rune stone in Minnesota one of the believers in the rune stone. I was talking to him once and he said, you're not a scientist, you tell me the rune stone can't be true. And I thought about that for a minute and I said, you're right, I'm 99.99% .99 sure that it's not true. The Kensington stone is part of a long series of fake artifacts in North America. It weighs 
200 pounds. It was discovered in 1898 by a farmer near Kensington. He claimed that he dug it out of the ground when he was clearing land and pulled up an aspen tree and tangled in the roots of the tree was a runestone. Why in the world would these Norse people come all the way into Minnesota as far as you can get from the ocean? And these are seafaring people. There's no way to get a Viking ship from Hudson Bay or from the St. Lawrence River into Minnesota. There's too many waterfalls. You can't get them here. Uh, I myself have done archaeological work at several supposed Viking sites. Now, if there's a Viking village here, we should be finding fragments of metal. We should be finding good evidence of fire. We should be finding lots of bone from the animals that they were butchering and eating. There was nothing. It was just mud. The real history of ancient Minnesota is the history of the Indian people who lived here. And that's who lived here in the 14th century. Not Norse explorers, but American Indians. And that's the story that we're finding when we excavate archaeological sites. We have archaeological sites dating to the 14th century, the 15th century, the 13th century. They're American Indian sites. This was their land, and this is their story we have to tell. The Dakota were mound builders. If you do a density map of where the mounds are in Minnesota, you see three core areas. Lake Mille Lacs, the Red Wing area, and the Lake Minnetonka area. And there's Mounds Park. These mounds are complex. Some of them are singular mounds, and some of them are group mounds. These big circular mounds tend to be the core and be the oldest, whereas the, all the little small round ones, that they tend to be very late. You know, they're the last mounds built. You have mounds that have actual burial chambers, which are just filled with dirt. And then there are other examples where those burial chambers have been entombed with local rock from the area. And those are burial pits. So you have the human body interred in the burial pits. You also have human interment directly into the mound above ground. When one of the first avocational archaeologists in Minnesota, Theodore Lewis, dug into those mounds, first in the 1860s and then in the 1870s, and Lewis wrote them up. And he found stone-lined crypts. So these are, you don't find these in Minnesota. Usually they're just, you know, the person is buried in the ground, in a hole in the ground, and then the dirt's heaped on top. My advisor at the University of Minnesota eventually wrote it up and he called it Hopewellian in Minnesota. And Mounds Park is the one that's related to this. I think the first thing that everybody needs to recognize is that these are sacred places. And you need to afford these places the same respect that you would any other cemetery or mortuary landscape. And having an understanding that those that are interred in this burial mound are descendants of the people who occupy the land today in many instances. Archaeology and Euro-American, European outlook in regards to human remains, historically, was very, very callous. But also, we have this horrible history of thinking that American Indians or anybody non-white is less of a person. And so those two things going hand in hand created a really horrific beginning of looting, of stealing bones, of stealing the things that people were buried with. People would get dressed up in their suits and go digging mounds because they thought there was treasure there. Well, there were no riches in the mounds in Minnesota. These were simply cemeteries. Again, we have to look at how these areas are classified. Many of these are classified as park areas, um, when all actuality they should be classified as cemeteries and then treated accordingly. In the late 1960s and early 70s, and Minnesota was one of the leaders in this, we started having conversations with each other saying, maybe this isn't right that we're digging in these mounds. So by 1973, all mound group excavations had ceased in Minnesota. Unless there was a road going through a mound, then you had to, we called salvage it, we had to get it out, and then the, then the bones were reburied. <laughs>
By that time, we were realizing, let's do everything we can to protect burials in Minnesota. And it doesn't matter what your ethnicity or what your religion, every burial is sacred and we should leave it alone. And uh, that's why the law was first changed in 1976 in Minnesota and then strengthened in 1978. And from then on, it's basically been illegal to dig into a mound unless you have the permission of the state archaeologist and the Indian Affairs Council, and that's just not going to happen. And so to have a state law that includes um, caveats for burial mound protection is again another tool that we utilize and we rely on. And we work in partnership with the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, who's entrusted with that responsibility statewide for burial mound protection. Back in the 90s, I was involved in a number of investigations documenting things that had been excavated from mounds from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and that were being considered for repatriation under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA, as it's more commonly known. I think coming out of that experience, it let me feel very comfortable about the idea of just leaving things alone. But it's our job as tribal historic preservation officers to exercise that law to its fullest extent to ensure that the return of these objects are successful and that not only lineal descendants, but communities have access to these objects as well. Some of the challenges that we see today with some of the federal land managing agencies is just the lack of understanding of how to engage tribes, what constitutes meaningful consultation. Some of the examples that we have that demonstrates meaningful consultation is when tribes are involved in the process early and often. As state archaeologist, I feel like one of my primary roles is to help archaeologists and the tribal communities do what they need to do to learn about our past, to preserve our past, and most importantly, to let other people know about the past that really is here because there's not enough outreach Let's take Indian Mounds Park, for example. Two years ago, the St. Paul Park and Rec introduced their five-year plan. Included in this plan were such improvements for trail realignment, site interpretation, all good things. However, included in those plans and designs were a splash pad in between the mounds, calling for more picnic areas and things like that. There was also a level of archaeology that was proposing to be done at Indian Mounds Park that we felt was intrusive archaeology. And so as a TIPO office, Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, we made a few recommendations to use technology that is non-intrusive to help delineate the burial mounds and to assist with the trail realignment. And so Without tribal voices at the table, you'll have this type of planning that doesn't take into consideration the cultural sensitivity of the area. Some of these areas, I mean, it would be wonderful, all of the areas that are really important to tribal communities gets more fully into the record so that we're more completely and on the front end aware of things before something bad happens. The National Register of Historic Places allows properties to be listed for four reasons. Are they important to history? Was there a famous person associated with them? Does it have some kind of unique or important architecture? The final one is called Criterion D, and that does it have research potential? Well, when we were realizing we shouldn't dig into mounds, all of a sudden their research potential plummeted. Secondly, a lot of the mounds were reconstructions. At one time, the people who lived on the other side of Mounds Boulevard didn't like the mounds because it blocked their view of the river. The park board in St. Paul cut down a lot of the mounds so people had a better view of the river. And then they realized about 20, 30 years later, oh, we shouldn't have done that because that was part of our history. They built the dirt up again. One thing that I was particularly interested in was whether the locations where mounds once had been but were no longer visible might contain sub-mound remnants, burial pits, or other things that are still there intact under the soil. Now, if you can't dig them, we can use things like ground penetrating radar. And this is a sound wave that actually goes into the ground, and then it bounces back, but it starts mapping what's down in the ground. 
The advances in geophysical technology have allowed us to gather information in a non-invasive, non-destructive way. One of those sites was the Indian Mound Park Mound Group here in St. Paul. Sure enough, they showed clusters of archaeological features, anomalies of some sort, in and right around the areas where the mounds had been mapped, but, which, but where they are no longer extant above ground. And so in terms of National Register significance, that shows us all those things together. Clearly, it was eligible. Just listed on the National Register of Historic Places about two years ago. And so one thing that has been incredible has been LIDAR. And it means light detection and ranging. It's an acronym, L-I-D-A-R. LIDAR is you go up in an airplane and have a laser. And the laser shoots down a beam and it comes back and it can measure the distance from hitting the ground and back. So LIDAR can build very, very accurate topographic maps. They can process that in lots of ways. They can kind of make the trees disappear and get a really close image. Very, very ephemeral features uh, like remnants of burial mounds, for example, that are difficult to see with the naked eye on the landscape can become visible. All these mounds that were mapped in the 1870s and 1880s by Theodore Lewis, you know, with his compass and with his pencil and his notebook, we now, we look at these groups that Lewis mapped and there might be 98 mounds that Lewis mapped there. We found five more using LIDAR that he didn't see because they were in a little bit of vegetation or something or there was a crop there then, he didn't see them. So finding mounds using LIDAR has been a revolution. Speaking specifically for the Red Wing area, Red Wing area had the largest concentration of burial mounds on the landscape in Minnesota. And some of the archeological evidence that we turn to tells us that some of these burial mounds were family burial mounds. Um, so you had family activity around these spaces. You can think of the Red Wing area as the metro area in Minnesota in the past. All these rivers were the freeways of the past because people were using canoes. There's lots of resources down there where the soil's easily tilled. So these are really great places to live. There were probably, we know about 12 very large villages. Immediately south of that were at least 500 mounds. Hardly any of those survived today because the big Red Wing Industrial Park is right there. Roads have gone through there. Lots of other things have gone through. And as far as who lived there, these were built by the ancestors of today's Dakota peoples. Mounds that do remain are valuable. Again, they connect people from the past to the landscape and help us understand, in some instances, the spiritual connection to these places. So recently, the Prairie Island Indian community purchased some land, and they didn't purchase this land because of its agricultural value or its economic potential. They purchased this land because it's part of a series of burial mound complex that are in pristine condition. And the burial mounds outside of this property have been heavily disturbed and looted. As owners and stewards of the property, the tribe can now implement protective measures that will further protect the site and hopefully enhance our understanding of the mounds and the complex that takes place there. Minnesota doesn't have many visible remnants of its ancient past. The Indians in Minnesota did not build with stone, so there's no ruins of their cities here. They had big cities, like we know at Red Wing, but there are no ruins of those cities. To find those cities, you've got to dig below the ground and find tiny fragments of these. So all we have left are the stone tools and the pottery and the remnants of some of the animals they're eating, and a lot of it's gone, we just can't see it. So if nothing else, the burial mounds in Minnesota are the one reminder on the landscape today that people lived here before us. I think it's important for anybody who's re-examining the burial mounds or working on burial mound protection in Minnesota to include the voices of native people. Oftentimes, oral history is left out and we focus more on just science. But again, there are native people here that have been here for millennia and have demonstrated that they're not going anywhere and so including tribal voices and expanding your methodology to include oral histories and engaging local tribal communities um, will help us better understand the landscape that we all share and occupy today.
in the landscape that was shared Ahana years ago as well. So for everybody in Minnesota, there's some place you can go in your region to still see some surviving mounds. But there are a couple of very rare places in Minnesota that you can also go. And the two that really jump out are Pipestone and Jeffers Petroglyph. At the Jeffers site, you can go and look at these rock ledges there of this Sioux Court site where there are figures and animals and symbols carved into the bedrock there, are these shelves of rock, which tell stories about the past. When I was a new archaeologist, we were looking through a pinhole at the past. Today we're looking, you know, at a knothole of the past. You know, someday maybe our window will be this big. Bound by Earth, Archaeology in Minnesota, is a TPT Partnerships co-production with the Minnesota Archaeological Society, tracing Minnesota's past since 1932. Additional funding has been provided by the State of Minnesota from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund through the Minnesota Historical Society. Mm -hmm.